Hello, my name is Robert Smallshear. Welcome to the 10th module of Python Beyond the Basics. In our predecessor course, Python Fundamentals, we introduced exceptions and exception techniques in a module called Handling Exceptions, where we covered the basics of exceptions and the specifics of how to handle them in Python. We also gave advice on when and how to deploy exception raising and exception handling in your code. This course module builds directly on the foundation we established in Python Fundamentals and in this module we seek to deepen our understanding of some of the tools Python provides for sophisticated error handling and reporting. We'll start by reminding ourselves of the basic exception handling and raising constructs and highlighting a practice you should avoid. Consider this simple program which uses the rand range function from the random module to choose a number between 0 and 99 inclusive. We then ask the user to guess the number, breaking out of the loop if they get the answer right. Let's give it a whirl. Python 3, handler.py. We'll try 10, no luck, 37, 53, 22, Ugh, this is quite a boring game. Let's press Ctrl C to exit. Let's have another go and see if we can cause it to break. 45, 21, 99, now 7 as a word. This time the program fails with invalid input. In the program we use the int constructor to convert the string returned by the input function to an integer. And when we use the word 7 rather than the digit 7, that conversion raises an exception, which is unhandled, and so the program exits. Let's fix our program by incorporating an exception handler around the problem statement. We do this simply by wrapping the statement in try except. In the exception handler, we use a continue statement to proceed immediately with the next iteration of the innermost loop, the while loop in this case. Let's try it. 10. 17, 7 as a word again, 9. When you're bored, press Ctrl C to exit the program. Oh dear, by not specifying an exception class, we've handled all exceptions, including the keyboard interrupt exception, which is raised when we press Ctrl C. Catching all exceptions is, in general, a very bad idea practically everything that can go wrong in a Python program manifests as an exception. Let's make another change. We'll replace our call to the int constructor with a call to a function foo. When run, this program will go into an infinite loop of repeatedly raising and handling the name error that is raised by the unknown foo function. Of course, the solution here is to catch the specific exception we're interested in, which in this case is a value error. With that change in place, the name error caused by foo propagates out and terminates the program with a stack trace. Let's revert to using the int function and our program now works completely as intended. In summary, you should almost always avoid omitting the exception class from an accept statement, since handling all exceptions is seldom required and usually a mistake. The built-in exception classes, of which there are many, are arranged into a class hierarchy using inheritance. This is significant, because when you specify an exception class in an accept statement, any class which is a subclass of the specified class will be caught, in addition to the specified class itself. Let's look at two built-in exception types with which we're already familiar, index error and key error. An index error is raised whenever we attempt an out-of-range lookup into a sequence type, such as a list. A key error is raised when we look up a missing key in a mapping type, such as a dictionary. Let's investigate the inheritance hierarchy of these two exception types. 
We know we can retrieve the transitive base classes from a class object using the MRO method, which returns the method resolution order of a class as a list. This shows the full exception class hierarchy from object, the root of all class hierarchies, down through base exception, the root of all exceptions, a class called exception, which we'll return to shortly, to lookup error, and finally index error. Now we'll try the same exercise for key error. We can see that key error is also an immediate subclass of lookup error, and so index error and key error must be siblings in the class hierarchy. What this means in practice is that we can catch both index error and key error exceptions by catching lookup error. Here's a short program which raises and handles one index error and one key error. It behaves as expected when run, printing handled index error and handled key error. Now we'll modify the program to handle lookup errors instead of the more specific exception types. When run, the program behaves identically because index error and key error are subclasses of lookup error. Let's take a look at the full hierarchy for the built-in exceptions, which we can find within the Python documentation. We've met many of these types already, including keyboard interrupt, stop iteration, zero division error, index error, key error, and of course the various types of syntax error when we've got something wrong. We must point out that over the history of Python there have been several changes to this exception hierarchy, so it's worthwhile checking the details for the exact interpreter versions you'll be using if your code needs to be portable. The hierarchy we're showing here is for Python 3.3. You'll see that base exception is at the root of the hierarchy. The only exceptions which derive from base exception, other than the exception class we'll come to shortly, are the so-called system exiting exceptions, most notably system exit and keyboard interrupt. We've already witnessed the untoward effects of intercepting and swallowing keyboard interrupt exceptions. Likewise, inadvertent handling of system exit, which is raised by the sys.exit function when a process is programmatically terminated, causes similar problems. The majority of exceptions derive from exception, so if you want to catch all exceptions except the system exiting exceptions, you might be tempted to catch this. Note, however, that a whole host of exception types typically associated with programming mistakes, such as syntax error, indentation error, tab error, name error, unbound local error, assertion error, and import error are also subclasses of exception, so handling exception has the potential to hide serious problems. In general, we encourage you to handle as specific exceptions as possible, although OS error in particular is useful for detecting that something has gone wrong with a file system operation without needing to worry about the details of whether it's a missing file indicated by file not found error or a permissions problem indicated by permission error. And even though we may catch a general type of error, the exception object we receive retains its original type and any exception payload so we're not passing up on any opportunities for detailed error reporting based on exception payloads. Most exception objects carry a simple payload which contains diagnostic information about what caused the exception. The majority of the built-in exception types accept a simple string in the constructor call. The exception type you will raise most frequently is probably value error, which is often used for argument validation guard clauses near the beginning of functions. Consider this function for determining the median value of an iterable series. The function accepts an iterable and then uses the sorted built-in to sort the items, computes the central index of the sequence, and depending on whether the sequence contains an odd or even number of items, either returns the central item or the arithmetic mean of the two middle items. Let's try this on a few sequences. It seems to be working just fine. So far, so good. But look what happens when we supply an empty list. 
we get an index error which contains a message payload displayed in the stack trace, list index out of range. This is all very well since we can't define the concept of median for an empty series, but we're leaking an implementation detail of our function here, namely that internally we're using a sequence lookup to perform the computation. Let's add a guard clause which checks that the supplied series is non-empty. In the guard clause we'll raise value error with a more informative and relevant error message. Now we get a much more useful error message in our stack trace. Most usually exception payloads are strings and are passed as a single argument to the exception constructor. The string should contain as helpful a message as possible. We can programmatically retrieve the message using the args exception attribute. Here we add a function to exercise our median function with faulty input, catch the value error and print the payload stored in its args attribute. When run, notice that args is a single element tuple containing the message that was passed to the constructor. Another way to retrieve the payload in string form is to convert the exception object to a string using the str or repr built-in functions. Although you might infer from this that multiple arguments can be passed to the exception constructor and that these will be available in the args tuple, and you would be right, you should only pass a single string argument to exception constructors. PEP352 is quite clear on the matter. No restriction is placed on what may be passed in for args for backwards compatibility reasons. In practice though, only a single string argument should be used. This means that you should only expect the args attribute to contain a single string value, which in any case you could retrieve by converting the exception to a string, rather than retrieving args zero. That said, specific exception classes may provide additional specific named attributes which contain further information about the cause. Unicode error is one such example, which has five additional named attributes. Encoding, reason, object, start and end. A rich collection of exception attributes like this can be a huge boon to debugging. When your needs aren't adequately met by any of the built-in exceptions, you can define your own. Consider this function, which uses Heron's formula to compute the area of a triangle given the length of three sides. This works well for side lengths that represent legitimate triangles, such as the 3-4-5 triangle. But if no triangle with the supplied side lengths exists, we get a value error from an attempt to find a real square root of a negative number. Rather than the obscure math domain error message here, we prefer to raise a more specific exception here, which can carry more useful information in its payload. A good start is to define our own exception class, triangle error. When doing this, you should subclass exception rather than base exception. If you just want a distinct exception type with basic facilities which can be raised and handled separately from other exception types, even the most basic definition can suffice. Here the body of the triangle error class definition contains a simple pass statement. It's empty. All the functionality we want is inherited from exception. This is a fully functioning exception. It inherits complete implementations of dunder init, dunder str and dunder repr. Let's modify our function to identify illegal triangles. We do this by sorting the three sides we are given and check that the length of the longest side isn't greater than the length of the two shortest sides added together. In this case we raise a triangle error with the message illegal triangle. This works as expected, there is no triangle with side lengths of 3, 4 and 10. 
Now let's modify our exception type to accept more data about the putative triangle. Our exception now overrides dunder init and provides a constructor which accepts a message and a collection of side lengths. The message is forwarded to the base class constructor for storage and the side lengths are stored in an instance attribute in the derive class. We store the side lengths in a tuple to prevent modification and provide a read-only attribute to access them. We also override the dunderstr and dunderrepa methods using the args attribute from the base class to retrieve our message string. Of course, we must also remember to modify the constructor call for the exception to pass the sides argument. Now, when we feed an illegal triangle into the function, not only do we get a better error report, including the side length information, but with an appropriate handler in place, we get programmatic access to the side lengths which caused the problem. Exception chaining allows us to associate one exception with another and has two main use cases. The first case is when during processing of one exception, another exception occurs, usually in a way incidental to the first exception. The second case is when we wish to deliberately handle an exception by translating it into a different exception type. In both cases there are good reasons for wanting to keep a reference to the original exception. It can avoid unnecessary duplication of information and it can improve diagnostic messages. Let's look at each of these two cases in turn. The first case is called implicit chaining and occurs when one exception occurs while another is being processed. The Python runtime machinery associates the original exception with the new exception by setting the special dunder context attribute of the most recent exception. Allow us to demonstrate by modifying our triangle area program by adding a main function which contains two bugs. The first bug is that we try to evaluate the area of a non-triangle with sides 3, 4 and 10. The second bug is that in the process of handling the resulting triangle exception we cause an io.unsupported operation exception by trying to print to the standard in stream instead of the standard error stream as we intended. Here's the stack trace we get when we run the program. See how, although the triangle error was handled by our accept block, it is still reported in the trace with the message during handling of the above exception, another exception occurred. Python is able to give us such a detailed report because the triangle error has been attached to the dunder context attribute of the unsupported operation exception object. We'll temporarily add some code to demonstrate this by capturing the unsupported operation as f and checking whether f.dunder context is in fact the triangle error object. When we run the program, we see that this is indeed the case. The converse of implicit chaining is explicit chaining. This is when we deliberately associate an existing exception instance with a new exception object at the point at which the latter is raised. This is usually done in the process of translating an exception from one type to another. Consider the following simple module. The inclination function returns the slope in degrees given the horizontal and vertical components of distance. This works fine for most slopes, but it fails with zero division error when the horizontal component dx is zero. Now let's modify our code by introducing a new exception type, inclination error, and an exception handler for the zero division error that swallows the active exception and raises a new one, in essence, translating one exception to another. We've included the syntax for explicit exception chaining here with the from e suffix when we create the exception. This associates the new exception object with the original exception e. However, unlike the implicit chaining, which associates the chained exception through the dunder context attribute, 
explicit chaining associates the chained exception through the dunder cause attribute. Let's see what happens when we trigger the exception. With an outer exception handler in place to capture the exception object, we can programmatically inspect the dunder cause attribute to retrieve the exception which represents the underlying cause. Whenever you translate exceptions in this way, typically at module boundaries, where you should be hiding implementation details by raising exceptions your clients can reasonably expect, consider whether to explicitly chain root cause exceptions to improve diagnostics and aid debugging. We've mentioned many times that everything in Python is an object, and this even extends to tracebacks, those records of the function call stack which are printed by the interpreter when an exception is unhandled and the program exits. In Python 3, each exception has a dunder traceback special attribute, which contains a reference to the traceback object associated with that exception. Let's add a main function to our chaining.py example to play with a traceback object. In the handler for the inclination error, we print e.dunderTraceback to display the traceback object. Shortly, it will become apparent why we've also decided to explicitly print finished before the program exits normally. To do anything useful with the traceback object, we should use the Python standard library traceback module, which contains functions for interrogating traceback objects. To display a traceback, we can use the print tb function. See how the program continues running after we've printed the traceback. The exception is being handled and the program is exited normally. The ability to get hold of traceback objects in this way is invaluable for logging diagnostic output. If you need to render the traceback object into a string, rather than printing it directly, you can use the format tb function instead of print tb. One word of caution here about keeping references to the traceback object. You should always render the output you need from a traceback object within the dynamic scope of the accept block. That is, you shouldn't store a traceback, or indeed exception object, for later use. This is because the traceback object contains references to all the stack frame objects which comprise the call stack, and each stack frame contains references to all of its local variables. As such, the size of the transitive closure of objects reachable from the traceback object can be very large, and if you maintain that reference, these objects will not be garbage collected. Prefer to render tracebacks into another form for even short-term storage in memory. The Python language includes an assert statement, the purpose of which is to help you prevent bugs creeping into your code, and when they do, to help you find them more quickly. The form of the assert statement is assert condition with an optional message after a comma, where condition is a boolean expression and message is an optional string for an error message. If the condition is false, an assertion error exception is raised, causing the program to terminate. If the message is supplied, it is used as the exception payload. Here's an example. The purpose of the assertion statement is to give you a convenient means for monitoring program invariants, which are conditions which should always be true for your program. If for some reason an assertion fails, it will always point to a programming error. Either some other part of the program is wrong, or at the very least the assertion statement itself is incorrect. If the assertion condition is true, the statement has no effect. Assertions are best used to document any assumptions your code makes, such as a name being bound to an object rather than none, or a list being sorted at a particular point in the program. There are many good and some very bad places to use assertions in your programs. Let's look at using assertions for internal invariants.
Often you'll see comments in code which document an assumption, particularly in conjunction with else blocks like this, where we assume that in the else block r must be equal to 2. Comments such as this are much better reformulated as assertions, which can check for truth at runtime. The assertion has just as much documentary value as the comment it replaces, but will be checked. It may seem like you're paying the cost of an unneeded comparison here, but in practice we find the overhead of most assertions is small compared to the huge benefits they bring in helping us build correct programs. The benefits of such assertions become particularly apparent when people use clone and modified programming, when new code is based on existing code that has been adjusted correctly or not, to suit a new purpose. Here, somebody has cloned and modified our modulus 3 function into a new function, modulus 4. Can you see the mistake? For some inputs, the assertion is violated, allowing us to identify the problem and correct the program. An alternative formulation of this construct might be like this, where all legitimate conditions are handled in the if and elif blocks, and the else clause contains only an assertion statement, which always fails because we pass a constant false to it. In fact, this form would not only be perfectly acceptable, it may even be preferable because the symmetry of the other cases makes it easier to spot blunders. Note that the assertion should not be used to validate arguments for the function, only to detect if the implementation of the function is incorrect. Now let's look at class invariants. Recall the sorted set implementation we developed in the previous course module, which used a sorted list of items as the internal representation. All methods in that class assume that the list is indeed sorted and remains that way. It would be wise to encode this class invariant as assertions at the beginning and end of every method, especially if you perform the exercise of making a mutable version of this collection type as we suggested. For example, the index method of the class assumes that the items are already sorted because it uses a binary search, and the count method depends on there being no duplicates because it performs a simple membership test. We can assert on these assumptions being true with the helper method is unique and sorted. This works by checking that each item is strictly less than its successor item for all items in the collection. We can then assert that is unique and sorted as a precondition to every method implementation. The precondition assertions we perform to test our sorted set assumptions are relatively expensive. In the case that the class is working as expected, each test walks through the whole collection. Worse, from a performance standpoint, is that sometimes the test is performed more than once. See that count is implemented in terms of dunder contains, and dunder contains is in turn implemented in terms of index. So when calling count, the assertion which affirms our assumption is made multiple times. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be detrimental to performance. Beyond trying to keep assertions both effective and cheap to evaluate, there is the possibility to run Python programs with all assertions disabled by using the dash O flag on the command line. Now we're running with active assertions without the dash O option. The best run takes a little over 3 seconds. Now again, without active assertions and with the dash O option. Ready? Steady? Go! Now the best time is 3.26 milliseconds. We encourage you to use this option only if performance concerns demand it, 
Running with assertions enabled in production can be a fabulous way of flushing out problems in your code. The majority of Python code is run with assertions enabled for this reason. Assertions can be used to enforce function post conditions, that is, to assure ourselves that a function is returning what we think it is returning. Consider this function, which we've placed in a module wrapper.py, which is used to wrap strings of text at a specified line length. This function, I'm sure you'll agree, is fairly complex, uses lots of mutable state, and in the words of Sir Tony Hoare, this is not code in which we could claim there are obviously no deficiencies, although it may be true that there are no obvious deficiencies. Let's define some text with which to test it. We'll import our wrap function and pass the wealth of nations to it, wrapping at a line length of 25 characters. Well, at least it appears to have returned a single string with embedded line endings. Let's print that string to get the result rendered in a more helpful way. Everything appears to work, but without counting the length of each line, it's difficult to be sure. And in any case, it's hard not to get distracted by Adam Smith's spelling of conveniences. Let's make sure this is working by adding an assertion prior to the return of the final result. Our assertion takes the string we're about to return, splits it back up into lines using the split line string method, and checks that the length of each line is less than or equal to the specified line length. We use the built in all function to check that this is true for all lines. Neat! Let's reload the code and try again. Ouch, our assertion failed, so the function isn't working as expected. The problem is that each time we add a word, we account for the length of the word in current line length, but we don't account for the space that will follow it when we join all the words back together using the join expression later in the program. The fix is to account for that length when we increase the value of current line length. The simplest approach is just to do this. But that introduces a so-called magic number into our code. Why is that one there? Only a careful reading of the code by future maintainers will reveal why. Better, we think, to be explicit about where the one comes from. It's the length of the space following the word. Rerunning with the fix in place, we can at least be sure that our function now meets its most basic requirement. Our wrap function isn't fully robust yet though. What happens when we pass a negative line length, such as minus 25? In this case, we also get an assertion error from the same assertion because, of course, the algorithm has no way to build lines of negative length. In a way, this is good. We found the problem. In other ways, this is bad, because the insertion is intended to check that the lines are too long, not that the line length is too short. But there's a deeper conceptual problem here, which is that assertions are intended to detect our mistakes as implementers of this function, not the client's mistakes as callers of the function. The client is clearly at fault here for passing a negative number to our function, and we should tell them so. If they were to see this assertion failure, they would assume, with no little justification, that they'd uncovered a defect in our code, rather than a problem with their code. For this reason, it's inappropriate to use assertions to validate arguments provided by code beyond our immediate control. In other words, don't be tempted to use assertions as validation guards, like this, where we assert that line length is greater than zero. Instead, prefer to raise a specific exception and document it appropriately. Here we raise a value error with the message that the line length is not positive, including the specific line length value that caused the problem.
now we get a reasonable exception that is predictable by any client who has read the documentation for our function. Much better. There's still an interesting case our code doesn't handle though. What should we do if the text contains a word longer than our line length? The next train to Slanfair Pur Gwingith Goga Ukol Dopos Santicilio Gogogok is at sixteen thirty two. First, we have to decide what is reasonable in this case. There are a few options. Either we weaken our requirement and produce overly long lines, or we reject text containing words longer than the line length, or we split a single word over multiple lines. In our case, we'll take the easy way out of rejecting overly long text by raising an exception. We do this by mapping the len function over all the words and checking the maximum value. It would be good practice to polish your Python skills by trying to modify this function to use one of the other strategies for overly long words that we mentioned, although we recommend avoiding getting bogged down in the hyphenation rules for Welsh. In this course module we've demonstrated the dangers of handling all exceptions, especially the so-called system exit exceptions, such as keyboard interrupt. We showed how these exceptions fit into the standard built-in exception hierarchy and explained how catching base exceptions can be used to catch multiple related exception types. We informed you that you should almost never catch the base exception or exception types since they have subclasses which are almost always programming errors, such as indentation error. We investigated how exception payloads work and how to use them effectively and we showed how to define your own exception classes by inheriting from exception. At its most basic, an exception subclass need only contain a single pass statement. Sometimes though, you'll want richer exception types, which you can implement by accepting additional arguments and providing additional attributes on your custom exceptions. We illustrated how to use exception chaining for both implicitly chained exceptions which set the dunder context attribute on successor exception objects and explicitly chained exceptions which set the dunder cause attribute on successor exception objects. We showed how to extract traceback objects from the dunder traceback attribute of exceptions and we counseled you to render tracebacks to strings rather than keeping references to them to avoid space leak problems with large object graphs reachable from the traceback instance. We finished off by looking at assertions, including not only how to use them, but when to use them. With these techniques, you should be able to create robust programs and modules, which are both easy to use, easy to diagnose, and easy to debug. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next module.